afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. The maple sugaring season is over, but is there another sugaring season getting underway? Well, for the past few years, researchers at UVM's Proctor Maple Research Center have been investigating the profitability of birch syrup. As it turns out, studying birch is not that much different than the roots of maple research. Here's Across the Fences, Keith Silva. The Proctor Maple Research Center was established as the first permanent maple research facility in the United States. The scientists and researchers who began their work here in 1946 were pioneers, establishing standards and setting grades that continue to impact the maple industry. Quantity. And over 60 years later, there are still pioneers working at Proctor Maple Research Center. People have been interested in trees that you put holes in and sap comes out for a really long time. So we Vandenberg not isn't trying to be flip to or sassy. In fact, her latest project puts her in almost the exact same place as her scientific forebears, with one big exception. She's tapping birch trees. And if that sounds a bit off, how about this? She's not even sure when to tap. We have no idea when to tap birch trees, none. It's, <laughs> it's really, there are a lot of really simple questions like that that we don't have good answers to. If maple syrup is considered a niche or a specialty product, then birch syrup is a niche of a niche of a specialty product. Out of the tree, birch sap looks exactly like maple sap. And like maple, birch syrup is used as a sweetener. And that's where these two similar saps sugar off and go their separate ways. Birch tends to be a little darker, um, but it is brought up to approximately the same density that maple syrup is. So it has a lot of the same look, um, but has a very distinct um, flavor that really, you know, is nothing like maple syrup. So it's um, really not appropriate to compare the two. They're really, you know, they're sweeteners, but they're two very, very different uh, products in themselves. So they might look a little of the same, but they, they really don't taste the same at all. Most of the world's birch syrup production comes from Alaska, and the supply is limited, which is one reason Vandenberg is interested in tapping into this market. Right now, the price for bir pure birch syrup is about $74 a quart. Um, so it's a very valuable commodity, um, both because of its limited supply and also uh, because it is, it's very difficult to produce in general to, and pr to produce well. And the demand for it is particularly heavy in the international markets. Then there's also the local food market. It's the local chefs that really want the product. So if this really goes forward, it would really re require some work to kind of develop those markets and foster those both of those types of markets to make sure that it's a product that people would buy in a you know, once we start producing it. Marketing birch syrup is putting the cart before the horse. Until then, Vandenberg and her colleagues need to solve the minor problem about when to tap. This tree here is, is one of our test trees. We've learned from other people who produce birch syrup that in order to get the most out of each tree, you need to tap it just at the right time. In maple, you're able to hedge a little bit, tap early, and not really uh, lose out on the, the total production. With birch, it's, it's important to get it just right. So we have a number of trees that we tap just to watch the sap flow and to see when it was really running. And when the majority, about 75% of those test trees are running, then we were able to start our experiment. So far, researchers have determined that birch sap starts to run about the time sugar maples have stopped running. The purpose of this study investigates if sugar makers in the Northeast could diversify their operations after the maple sugaring season. Sugar makers would essentially switch their taps from maples to birches. So we are tapping a set of 40 birch trees of tappable size and a range of diameters and collecting the sap from them and measuring that sap to determine what is the volume of sap that is collected from each of those trees. And we also measure their sugar content. So at the end of the season, we can calculate the average quantity of sap and sugar that is able to be harvested 
um, from birch trees in our operation. So then we'll then use that average yield to do some economic calculations to determine, okay, given an operation with a certain number of birch trees and a certain functioning of their maple operation, certain equipment, et cetera, how many birch trees would you have to have in order to make birch syrup production a profitable venture? This research is funded by the Northeastern States Research Cooperative. What Vandenberg and her funders are banking on is that modern sugaring technology, like reverse osmosis, which concentrates the sugars in the sap, will increase the amount of birch syrup that can be produced. On average, the sugar content of maple sap is about 2%. Birch sap tends to be about half that, and often even less. Vandenberg estimates that it could take at least 100 gallons of birch sap to make one gallon of syrup. We really didn't have a way to make birch syrup profitably in the Northeast before. There, you know, the lower sugar content, the lower sap yields really just didn't make it, uh, you know, a winning proposition before. And so that is one of the reasons that it hasn't been, you know, the line of inquiry hasn't really been pursued that heavily before other than sort of just um, from a purely scientific standpoint, looking at why the pressure is produced and things like that. Um, so now we have these tools and techniques and technologies that enable us to say, well, perhaps we could make this a profitable venture. So, you know, all the resources that we've had developed from doing research in Maple, we're able to apply that what we've learned to Birch. This project is designed to study sap yields and correlate profitability, not make syrup. One of the hallmarks of applied science is that every answer generates 10 more questions. Like those researchers who came here in the late 1940s, Vandenberg and her colleagues are learning more than what they set out to do. We're kind of curious uh, as to exactly how and why birch trees are doing what they're doing. Um, it's a very, it's a different sap flow mechanism than maple. Um, maple sap flow is based on a stem pressure mechanism. Birch sap flow is based on root pressure, so it develops in a different way. Um, so we are doing some measurements of the pressure inside birch trunks across the season, uh, but in both tapped and untapped birches, to see how the pressure develops and um, also trying to link that with air temperature and soil temperature and things like that, so that we can get a little bit of a better handle on exactly how pressure develops in birches that will kind of inform our decisions of, okay, so if we're going to tap birch trees, when is it best to tap them, uh, how early, how late, things like that. Some of those sort of management type questions that we'll need to eventually answer a little better than we know now um, if this turns out to be a profitable venture. Oh, wow. This monitoring station, built by researcher Mark Isselhart out of a cooler, keeps all the electronics warm and dry. His ingenious efforts are being rewarded with some new data that only Mother Nature has ever known. Trees that we have wired up for pressure and temperature are giving us readings of the internal pressure in the tree. And we know from um, the literature that the tree um, can develop quite high pressure, as high as 30 PSI or higher. What isn't well known is what the pressure is in a tree after it's been tapped. So we actually have a tree, several trees wired with sensors to measure the pressure in the tree. And we also have one that has a tap hole in it that we're collecting in a bucket. So we're able to get really for the first time what the pressure in the tree is when it has sap flowing out of it. It will be a while before the word birch gets added to the name of the Proctor Maple Research Center. For now, this research is strictly in the name of science. It all boils down to being very curious and interested in how trees work and what they do, how they do what they do, and sometimes why they do what they do. And this is just another piece of that, another um, problem or question under that umbrella that is really fascinating to look at and investigate. Maybe maple and birch aren't so different. After all, each of these trees has been researched tested and studied for decades, and they have yet to yield all of their secrets. In Underhill, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. 
Well, thanks, Keith. In that story you heard from Proctor Center researcher Mark Iselhart, this spring Mark took a new job. He remains based at Proctor, but he is now the Maple Production Educator for UVM Extension. Across the Fences, Rebecca Gollin spoke with Mark about his new job and how he will support Vermont's multi-million dollar maple industry. What's your role as UVM Extension's new maple production educator? Well, largely my role is to work with producers and help them uh, utilize research in, in their operations to increase yields or maintain the health of their trees. We use various things to communicate with producers. Uh, one of the largest formats is the January Maple Schools, which is two one-day sessions where people come and learn basically everything there is to know about sugaring. Um, everything from the tiny backyard operations all the way up to the really large commercial sized operations. How did your interest in maple come about and where did you receive your education and training? I grew up in Bennington, Vermont and uh, although my family doesn't have a history of sugaring, I did have friends who, who made syrup and helped them a little bit. It wasn't until I went to the Governor's Institute of Vermont uh, Natural Resources um, School, it was during a summer program, and I learned about dendrology and you know, more natural resources issues. Um, that's really when my interest in forestry and natural resources took off. I went to UVM and got a degree in forestry. And as I was a forestry student, I got a work-study job at the Proctor Center. I was hired by Sumner Williams to be a firewood chopper and uh, any number of things just to help with the, the tubing operation. And that's where I learned about maple research. That was my first experience with maple research. What do we know about climate change in the maple industry? So there has definitely been some work looking at impacts of a change in climate on sugaring. The thing about maple sugaring is it's, it's uh, tremendously dependent on the weather right during that season. So that four to six week season that we typically collect our sap in, if you don't have ideal weather during that period, it can have a dramatic impact on sap collection. So if, for the past two winters, we've had quite cold winters. So there hasn't been a lot of sap collection because it's been too cold. The risk is then that it gets too hot too fast and you run out of ideal temperatures before the tree comes out of dormancy. If you look over the long period, relatively long period, maybe the last 50 years or so, we've seen that the season has started earlier than it has historically, and it's ended earlier, and there's been a bit of a contraction, so the, the season itself is a little bit shorter than it once was. It's definitely starting earlier than it was before. Sugar makers have been able to adapt to that in a few different ways, most notably using vacuum and tubing, um, and to be a little less dependent on those ideal temperatures the freezing and thawing temperatures, which really drive sap flow. So um, they, there's an impact there. Going forward, you hear a lot about species migration, like we're gonna have the climate of you know, mid-Atlantic states and maples will you know, somehow migrate north. That may happen over the long term, but the impact for a sugar maker in the short term is gonna be losing those ideal weather days in that really brief period. You know, we say the sugaring season is four to six weeks, but the bulk of production is made on far fewer days, really good high flow days. The rest in between are okay, but not, nothing like a really big high flow day. So looking forward, how will you measure your impact in your new role? Well, I think certainly if producers have questions, you know, that you get an immediate impact there when, when you're able to help someone and, and, and uh, respond to their needs, whether it's a just a pure tree question or something more complicated, more applied about their tubing operation or their sugaring in general. Um, broadly, we're hoping to focus on issues about syrup quality to make sure that regardless of the size of your operation, that we're all producing high quality syrup. So, you know, to make sure that issues involving filtering or flavor are, are well taken care of and, and, and people are continue to produce high quality syrup. And that can be reflected in any number of ways, but um, you know, hearing good feedback from producers uh, is certainly a big one. Um, and then on the production side, maintaining high yields. Like I said, you know, if you have to make a wound in the tree every year, you have to drill a hole in the tree every year, getting the most out of that tap hole without impacting the tree's health is gonna be 
an important uh, impact. So there's a lot of work that goes into sugaring, and uh, there's there's um, there's lots of good techniques and technology available to maximize your production, as long as it's not at the expense of, of the trees. And our congratulations to Mark on his new appointment with UVM Extension. That's our program for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. Thank you.